Drug and alcohol testing is the norm in modern day aviation. Pilots, cabin crew, and any safety sensitive employee can be random, show cause, and post incident tested. For good reason, as it's obvious alcohol, illegal, and even some prescription drugs can degrade a pilot's performance in the cockpit. So stringent drug and alcohol testing has become standard practice in modern day aviation. But it hasn't always been this way. As always, the accidents of the past have shaped modern aviation into its current form. And on a dark, snowy night in January 1988, a pilot under the influence commenced a non-standard approach to a small airport in southern Colorado. The results would be devastating, and they would change aviation forever. It's 12.30 local time at Denver's Stapleton International Airport. A Trans Colorado Airlines captain and first officer are signing on for a PM duty, Stephen Silva and Ralph Harvey. They'll be flying a Fairchild Metro 3 on a six sector day. First flying out from Denver to Wyoming, stopping in Riverton and Casper, before returning and flying a route through Southwest Colorado, stopping in Durango before heading down to Cortez. As the crew sign on and work through their pre-flight planning, they encounter a fairly standard day of winter's weather over the Rockies. A large low pressure region is centered over Missouri, while a trough extends through the Colorado area, generating moderate winds, overcast skies, and showers of snow. It'll mean a day of flying in the soup and shooting instrument approaches for Captain Silver and First Officer Harvey. Nothing unusual, but something which will require slightly more focus and put a slightly higher workload on the pilots. It's a day that will begin with a delay, however. The poor weather that extends across Colorado is affecting operations at Stapleton, causing delays across the networks of airlines. Trans Colorado was one of the numerous airlines with a base here in Denver. They were founded in 1980 with just a single Metro 2, focusing on flights within Colorado, New Mexico, and Wyoming, operating under an agreement and the branding of Continental Airlines. The Wyoming Triangle is a classic example of the niche market that it services, providing passengers with connections to smaller towns and communities not served by the bigger airlines. The service for today will be delayed, however, as the aircraft arrives in Denver late. Captain Silva and First Officer Harvey probably watch it roll onto the bay in the poor weather. The Metro 3 isn't exactly known for its luxury. It's a narrow, loud, and unforgiving twin turboprop, with room for just 19 passengers and a max takeoff weight of 16,000 pounds. By the time the crew turn it around, load the passengers and cargo, as well as refuel, they were over an hour late, departing at 2.25 p.m. local time as the pilots finally start their day of flying. Captain Silver will be hoping to pull some strings to get back on schedule, however. He has a reputation across the Denver base for being able to get a plane back on time by the end of the day. In fact, some of his colleagues say he operates too quickly. They've commented that he has a tendency to rush and taxis quickly but is an above average pilot. Normally, the details and history of the operating crew are minor details in the context of these videos, and we blow past them fairly quickly. But as we'll see later in their day, the history of the individuals could not be more pertinent to the events which will occur. So we'll take a look at their history in detail. The 36 year old Silver has certainly had a colorful career, before his time with Trans Colorado, it included one fateful day in 1983, when he destroyed a Cessna 182 by, as the NTSB said, selecting the wrong runway, improperly compensating for wind, misjudging distance, and delaying a go-around. As a result, he had to be re-examined by an FAA inspector, and completed a course to continue his flying career just a few weeks later. Three negative comments are contained on his personal records with Trans Colorado. 
One was from an incident in September as he travelled as a non-revenue passenger along with his companion. Non-revenue passengers are generally airline staff and their families who fly standby, taking spare seats on a flight but paying just a fraction of the cost. When Captain Silver flees standby from Houston to Denver, accompanied by his wife, he became enraged when his luggage was reportedly lost. A ground agent who was yelled at by the captain stated that he did not identify himself as a non-revenue passenger, a violation of company rules, which extended further because intriguingly, the companion he was travelling with was not actually his wife. Silver was written up again in November when his efforts to save time went slightly too far. He decided to refuel an aircraft himself in Houston, while the very next day, he allowed a late passenger to board with one engine already running, both blatant violations of company policy. It's no wonder that in less than two years with the company, Captain Silver's reputation is already so clearly formed. It's a reputation that First Officer Ralph Harvey is fully aware of. He's been operating with Captain Silver for the last month, as part of the one month roster rotations organised by Trans Colorado. The only relief he's had from Silver has been the couple of days he's been called off reserve. Harvey has been with Trans Colorado for about 6 months. He has 8,500 total hours, and unlike his captain, his record with the company is completely clear. But the pertinent details of his history come from before his time with Trans Colorado. He began flying as a professional pilot in 1974 working as a flying instructor. In 1980, he became a first officer for commuter airline Pioneer Airways, but just after starting, he was terminated. The reason being his lack of proficiency when attempting to upgrade to captain. An instructor from the airline said he demonstrated periods of inaction as the flight regime required changes in the aircraft's configuration or attitude or a change of phase of flight. A jargony way of saying that his technical flying skills simply weren't up to scratch. Harvey didn't list his short time with Pioneer on his application with Trans Colorado, but his struggles didn't end there. After failing his upgrade, he moved to Alaska where he was employed as a charter pilot. He failed a proficiency check there and was limited to visual flight rules only, before he moved back to Colorado in 1986, picking up a job with Trans Colorado nine months later. The Trans Colorado training for Ralph Harvey went substantially smoother, passing with average scores and only a couple of negative comments, stating weak but improved and overcorrecting and chasing needles during ILS. He ended up passing his proficiency check though, including the demonstrated use of ILS and VOR approaches. Outside the two pilots' flying careers, there's even more drama. Harvey has several driving and alcohol related offences on his record, while Silver has committed driving offences himself, including speeding, improper yielding, and disobeying traffic signals. There'll be no exam on the pilot's history at the end of the video, but you've probably got the picture. While Silver and Harvey are completely qualified and more than capable of operating as airline pilots, there are clearly weaknesses in their technical and non technical skills. As the aircraft arrives back in Denver, now just 42 minutes behind schedule, these weaknesses will all play a role in the crew's next flight. It'll be flight number 2286, operated on behalf of Continental Express, with 15 passengers travelling from Denver to Durango and then Cortez. The flight takes off 40 minutes late at 6.20pm local time. The flight time will be approximately 72 minutes. It'll depart on the 185 radial from Denver before tracking for the Blue Mesa Vortac and then direct to Durango. The cruise altitude is 22,000 feet, but this is amended to 23,000 as the crew climbs out of Denver without incident over the towering Rockies of Colorado. Trans Colorado 2286 is level at flight level 230. Trans Colorado 2286, Roger. Durango 0103 local observation. Indefinite ceiling 800, sky obscured. Visibility 1 mile. 
Light snow and fog. Temperature 25, dew point 25, altimeter, uh, correction, wind is calm. Air traffic control passes on the current weather for Durango as Trans Colorado reaches its cruise altitude. The weather is deteriorating in showers of snow, with just one mile of visibility and cloud all the way down to 800 feet. To get below the cloud, the crew will need to conduct an instrument approach, while with the wind calm, an approach to either runway 20 or 02 is available. Trans Colorado 2286, would you rather shoot the ILS or uh, will the VOR DME approach to runway 20 be sufficient? We'll plan on the DME approach, Trans Colorado 2286. Air traffic control has offered the choice of two approach types to Captain Silver. An ILS, or instrument landing system approach, would get the aircraft down to a lower minimum altitude, but it's lucky he decides against it because the ILS has just been NOTAMed out of service. A NOTAM is a notice to airmen, which in this case is reporting that the ILS is unavailable due to the equipment being buried in snow. The reason for deciding on the VOR DME approach was probably because it's quicker anyway, and we know that Captain Silver will take any chance he can to save time. A VOR DME approach is made up of two separate components. The VOR, or Very High Frequency Omnidirectional Range, is a piece of ground-based equipment that beams out 360 radials on a VHF radio frequency. An aircraft's antenna picks up these signals and displays them in the cockpit as the aircraft bearing from the station. DME simply stands for Distance Measuring Equipment. It allows for the distance between the aircraft and the station to be displayed in the cockpit. When they're combined, instrument approaches can be designed, which allow aircraft to fly along set courses for certain distances above certain altitudes to avoid terrain. These 2D approaches can guide an aircraft laterally all the way to a runway, but the pilots must pay particular attention to the minimum altitudes of each segment, because unlike a 3D approach, there's no glide slope to follow for vertical guidance, so they need to ensure they're above each minimum altitude for the charted segment, thus avoiding any terrain which could be lying below. Trans Colorado 2286, if you want to proceed, direct to the Durango 023 radial. 11 mile fix, that's approved. Trans Colorado 2286 will do. Any instrument approach is supposed to commence at the initial approach fix. Looking at the chart for the VOR DME approach to runway 20, the initial fix is located on the 096 radial, 11 miles from the VOR. From here, an aircraft would join the 11 mile arc, simply a shallow turn to maintain a constant DME distance from the VOR before turning onto the final course of 203 towards the runway, a radial of 023. However, when air traffic control provides vectors to aircraft, they're allowed to intercept the final approach course directly, without the need to track to the initial approach fix. Flight 2286 is located to the northeast, so this will save significant time for Captain Silver. He's accepted the offer from air traffic control, as most Trans Colorado crews tend to do when operating this flight. The schedule allows just 70 minutes for the sector, and tracking all the way to the initial fix would put Silver and Harvey even further behind. Trans Colorado 2286, descend at pilot's discretion to 16,000 feet. Roger, Trans Colorado 2286, leaving 230 for 16,000. As the pilots commence their descent, there's one major threat they should be considering. And Trans Colorado 2286, descent to 15,000. 15,000, Trans Colorado 2286. With extremely high terrain to the north of the approach into Durango, Flight 2286 must remain at a high altitude before commencing the approach. This is the reason it's designed for aircraft to fly around the DME arc first. It allows the final course to be intercepted at 10,400 feet. But with 2286 coming straight in, the sector altitude to the northeast is 15,100 feet. They're identified on radar by air traffic control, so this can be reduced to 14,000, but that's still way higher than what's optimal for the instrument approach. All that being said, pilots at Trans Colorado, especially Captain Silver, will be used to this type of approach. It'll just mean they need to keep the speed back 
extend flap early, and maintain a high descent rate after passing the 11 DME point. A challenging approach, but nothing that should be beyond the ability of the two pilots. Trans Colorado 2286, cross the Durango 023 radial 11 mile fix at or above 14,000 feet. Cleared for the VOR DME approach runway 20. Down to 14 and we're cleared for the approach. There's unfortunately no cockpit voice recorder and no cockpit data recorder installed for this flight. But even the delayed response from the captain here may show that the high workload is getting close to his limit. The last remnants of the aircraft's position on air traffic control's radar show it crossing the 11 mile fix at 14,000 feet. From here, it commences a steep descent. Uh, radar coverage is terminated. 2286, we'll go. The radar shows a descent rate of up to 3,000 feet per minute. This is an extraordinarily high rate on an instrument approach, but coming straight in from a high altitude with a slight tailwind is what's required to get down to the runway. A high level of concentration and flying ability will be needed. Many captains flying into Durango only fly this approach themselves, but for this one, First Officer Harvey is on the controls. Captain Silver should be monitoring him closely, but probably isn't aware of his history of struggling when flying on instruments. Through 515 feet, the Metro 3 breaks clear of the cloud. We don't know for sure, but the runway lights likely come into sight for the crew. They probably relax slightly, knowing they won't have to make a missed approach, which will generate even more delays. However, still on the controls, First Officer Harvey continues to descend at a high rate. All of a sudden, the runway lights disappear from view, and then... Colliding with trees and flying over the top of a hill, before impacting the ground close to the bottom, it comes to its final resting point at 7,100 feet above sea level, 4.8 miles from the end of the runway. Captain Silver and First Officer Harvey are dead, with the aircraft crushed from the nose to the front row of passengers. At the back of the aircraft, eight passengers survive, with injuries ranging from serious to completely unscathed. No help is immediately on the way, however. The aircraft disappeared off radar minutes before it collided with terrain. The Civil Air Patrol is notified by the Durango County Airport that the flight is overdue, but nothing can be done. There's no way of knowing where it ended up in its final minutes. Half an hour later, they receive a call from a local resident, who tells them he's with a man who is reported surviving a plane crash. The man had walked in the dark through heavy snow to reach a light in the distance coming from the house. From here, rescue units are organized and arrive at the crash site at 10.26 p.m. with survivors transported to hospital but a total of nine, including the two pilots, receiving fatal injuries. Plotting the radar data, along with the plane's final resting place, shows that First Officer Harvey correctly maintained a high descent rate to reach the proper profile for runway 20, but for some reason, this high descent rate continues, almost completely unchanged, all the way to the ground. There's not much to go on because there were no black boxes on the plane, a requirement that will be introduced shortly after this crash. But for the short period they were below the cloud, the pilots may have been able to see through to the runway, with the visual approach path indicator obscured by the very hill they would eventually collide with, it hiding the red lights indicating they were dangerously below slope. Crew workload is something that's talked about a lot in modern day safety investigations. One way of simplifying and talking about it is using the bucket analogy. If we think about everything filling up the bucket on Trans Colorado 2286's approach into Durango, there's a lot. On top of all the usual requirements of operating a complex aircraft, a complex approach was also underway, as well as a steep descent requirement so they could fly straight in. A tailwind forcing an even higher descent rate, and a low cloud ceiling meaning an approach almost to minimums. First Officer Harvey's history of struggling with instrument approaches also probably had an impact. 
reducing the size of the bucket itself. It was speculated that his history with alcohol could have played a role, but his blood samples tested negative. There was something though that did tip the water over the edge, something which reduced the size of the bucket just enough, ultimately leading to disaster. And it came as a bombshell when the NTSB received a phone call one month after the crash. It came from a corporate pilot who reported meeting a woman claiming to be Captain Silver's fiance. She said to him, I'm sure glad that we were able to bury him right after the accident, because the night before we had done a bag of cocaine and I was worried that the autopsy would say there were traces of this in his system before he died. Investigators would have been shocked. While the captain and first officer's blood samples were tested for alcohol, they were not for cocaine. Further, the woman's credibility was established when her name was found to match the woman who had been with the captain when his luggage was controversially lost. A subsequent retesting of Captain Silver's archived blood sample came back positive for cocaine, a result that took his family completely by surprise. He had had dinner with his parents the night before and reportedly told them he would go to bed early with work the next day. They were none the wiser to his using of cocaine, but one of Silver's friends was, telling the NTSB, He wasn't himself anymore. I knew right off that there was some kind of drug problem. He acted, oh, very nervous, like he was scared of something. He'd look over his shoulder a lot as if there was someone behind him when there wasn't. And he was just real jittery. Cocaine alters the metabolism of the neurochemical processes that form the basis for the functioning of the nervous system, and psychological effects include an increased heart rate, high blood pressure, and altered brain waves. It was this that was, or at least could have been the tipping point. After all, we don't know exactly what was going on in the cockpit. All we know for sure is that the bucket was overflowing because some serious errors occurred, as the aircraft was put into a dangerous, undesired aircraft state before it crashed, resulting in the deaths of nine of the people on board. Following the NTSB investigation, a dance between the safety recommendations and the FAA's regulations followed, with airlines and the FAA implementing random drug testing in following years. Since Trans-Colorado, there have been no further accidents linked to illegal drugs in America, while the issue of alcohol with pilots remains one to be fully addressed, though mostly in countries outside the US. There were other significant impacts from 2286 as well, relating to how instrument approaches are designed and actually flown by the airlines that use them. While black boxes and ground proximity warning systems are required now on all flights with 12 seats or more, Consequently, though it could never be proven, Trans-Colorado 2286 may have actually saved as many lives, if not more, than it killed. A testament to the strong safety culture that exists in aviation, and an assurance that no death ever goes to vain.